And we are back on the chosen baseball journey with the one and only Kareem Garcia, Jonathan A. Cohen, author of the Bible 3.0 right behind you. And Kareem, you know, we just went straight to taping today. I didn't want to talk off air because <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the room you're in. I'm seeing some magical memorabilia behind you. I'm getting very, very excited. So this is the first time we're talking about it. You could share with the audience. Uh, it looks like some Team Mexico memorabilia over here. Yes, uh, right behind me, right here is the uh, the first uh, shirt I used for the WBC in two thousand six for Team Mexico, and you see the picture right there with my coach. Uh, I'll see if I can close it up a little bit right here. I got my hands up, and I got a couple other ones over here for. The team I play in Mexico in the in the winners, Naranjeros, and then the Cleveland Indians right here. And over here I have a a shirt when I play with the Mets that uh, Tom Glavin signed for me. And a couple other things that I have over here, you know. You you play so I'm with... in Mexico. I'm I'm in mean, hometown in Mexico, so <laughs> a little different than before. Everybody needs their man cave. It's so funny. You know, everybody loves their memorabilia. So that's really great that you kept some of your treasures. Um, and of course, Tom Glavin, pretty decent pitcher I heard back in his day. Yeah, he was all right. <laughs> he was great. He was a great pitcher, a great teammate, uh, and a great golfer too, believe it or not. Why is that that a lot of baseball players, sports athletes in general, I know hockey players, what transcends that they all tend to be great golfers? What is it about uh, these team sports that brings you all over to golf? Well, I, I think golf uh, takes a lot of stress from you. And it's only you against the the whole course. So if you make a mistake, it's on you and nobody else. It's not a team sport. You have to really concentrate, but at the same time, kind of makes you relax a lot. And and a lot of the pitchers had the opportunity to play golf because they got the most time, you know, at, a, at anyone. Because hitters, every day you have to go and, and, you know, prepare yourself for the game, for batting practice, stretch, running, gym, the whole nine yards. And pitchers, if you're a starter, it's only once every five days or sometimes once every six days. Now, the relievers is a different story. That's a different monster. They they cannot because they never know exactly when they're going to be off and they're going to be on unless they pitch three days in a row and then they know they're not going to go the fourth day. So that that's when they probably play golf. Now, a guy, I'm not sure if he played golf or not, but you may know him. I don't. Can you tell, see the picture behind me, the, the pitcher pitching? Yes. Can you see who that is? No, I can't. Los Angeles Dodgers, Japanese sensation, Hideo uh, Nomo. Hideo Nomo, yeah. And why do I have this Hideo Nomo picture? It's funny. You can't see it, but it says, to Charlie. So this was personalized for Charlie. Who is Charlie, you may ask? This mm -hmm. belonged to Charlie Sheen. This was from Charlie Sheen's private collection. Wow. The actor, well known for his role in the Cleveland Indians in Major League, <laughs> right? And yes. I thought that was just a cool piece of memorabilia. And the ticket underneath Hideo Nomo is his MLB debut in San Francisco against the Giants. So funny piece of baseball history. Before we start today's taping here, as far as our topic today, because we got a very big topic we got to discuss. Because we, you know, the world of baseball, it doesn't end, right? Especially during baseball season now. We're sitting in April and there's a lot going on. I'm, of course, watching a game, listening to an interview with John Cruck. Remember John Cruck? Of course, the first baseman, Philadelphia, is scared to hit against uh, Randy Johnson. A little crazy, would you say, John Crock? Yeah, this is one of those guys a little bit up there, you know, funny, everything. So I thought you're the perfect person to verify a John Crock story because John Crock, you know, is not exactly, I would say, the more sane people in baseball, but he loves to tell a good story. So his story goes like this. When he was playing in the Mexican League, they mm -hmm. used to hold an exhibition game against the Mexican prison. That's that's yeah. what John Crock is saying. And he, he's, he goes up first to bat, and the catcher is catching without any catching gear. And John Crock says, I'm not going to play with this guy if he's not going to catch with some gear. This is scaring me. So... 
They check with the team, the Mexican team. They find some extra gear for the catcher. Catcher puts on his gear. He did give it back. And John Crux says this lefty pitcher, he's really throwing hard. He's really nasty. What would, what did he go to prison for exactly? And the catcher whispers to him, he caught his girlfriend cheating. So he took the girlfriend and her boyfriend and he burned them alive in a car. Damn. And the guy commenting with John Crux keeps calling the balls and strikes like there's no big deal. <laughs> Do you think that really happened? Do you think John Crux really played against the Mexican prison team? I don't know. It might be true to tell you because um, I he, I know he played in Mexicali in the winter time, and sometimes they do make uh, back in the days uh, some exhibition games. I don't remember if they went. I mean, if they play against the guys from jail, they had to go inside jail to play in there. So it might be true. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of difficult not to say yes because I mean I I know that back in the days they did that. I'm talking about back in the early nineties. And that's quite the story, obviously. And and they told Croc after the game, they go and have lunch with the prisoners. And they said, keep your hand on your on your hat the whole time when you walk in. Why do you think that was? Well, they're going to steal the hat for sure. In two seconds. In two seconds. <laughs> well, today's topic, a guy who's having a good time in Mexico besides Kareem is the one and only Trevor Bauer. Trevor Bauer is coming up nonstop on our feed Every MLB feed, aside from MLBs, obviously, people uh, keep wanting to discuss it. And there was a recent game. You and I were talking about it off the air. Kareem, Kareem, Kareem. You know, we just had recently the big uh, series in Mexico between Houston and Colorado. I watched both games. Uh, Houston's pitchers looked fantastic out there. Blanco except for a couple blips. He was pretty solid out there. Framber Valdez comes back from injury. And they're saying, you know, with the altitude, these games are going to be 16-14. And you know what? The Houston pitchers were teeing off like they were in Colorado. Uh, mm -hmm. But the Houston pitchers look pretty good. Bauer in his last game in the Mexican League, how about this for tying a Mexican League record? Uh, striking out nine guys in a row. In one of the innings, he struck out three guys on nine pitches, 14 strikeouts in five innings. Uh, this goes back to the records in 79 and 1964. Kareem, Kareem, Kareem. When I'm watching this in Mexico and what's supposed to be a hitter's park, I'm ready to give him the minimum contract and sign him up immediately. MLB GMs must be watching this and saying, this is getting pretty tempting now. Yes, of of course, especially because he's doing such a great job in a hitter's park, you know, with the altitude in Mexico throwing, like you mentioned, they only, he only gave up three hits. And his last outing, which was about two days ago, he pitched against Tabasco and uh, pitched seven innings, struck out another 10, 12 guys, and gave up, I think, one or two runs only. So, I mean, and Tabasco has a pretty decent hitters. I'm talking about guys that play in the major leagues. No, yes, Mexican guys. I'm, I'm talking about guys with experience. So Bauer is doing everything the right way to get back to the major leagues. So now, like you mentioned it, I mean, a lot of a lot of people gotta be uh, watching him. You know, especially the GMs. It's just a matter of time to give him the opportunity to get back to to the big leagues. And you know, I mean, Dodgers need a starting pitcher, and Yankees. I mean, Baltimore. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of teams out there that they need a, a starting pitcher. And I'm not talking about the fifth. I'm talking about uh, an ace, a number two, a one or two. So, look, we're gonna. I promise you, next week I have a list ready for you. The episode is gonna take 13 hours long because I gotta go through all <laughs> the list of elbow and lat injuries. Never mind every other injury, just elbows and lats this year. But in all seriousness, uh, you have all these teams, and you have all this payroll tied up. You have scouting. There's a lot of jobs that are on the line for a team to do well and make the playoffs. And if I'm a GM and I'm thinking to myself, my job doesn't rest generally if the team is going to do well in five years. It's going to do if they're going to do well in the next five minutes. And when two or three of your pitchers start going down, it's getting nerve-wracking. They're getting nerve-wracking. So 
I thought about this long and hard, Kareem, because I said to myself, okay, so let's say the Dodgers, no chance they're going to sign him. I get this. The Mets, yeah. there was the issue before that they were going to sign him when he was a free agent. That didn't work out. He's been to the Diebacks. He's been to the uh, Guardians. Used to be the Indians. Probably not going back there. He did very well on the Reds. Uh, Reds, with all their hitting, could use more pitching, seriously. But mm -hmm. I've come up with it. It's got to be, I think, because, you know, West Coast and not a lot of fans getting drawn and all the controversy surrounding them. Oakland A's, right now, I see nothing holding them back. This is a team that has a star closer now. Miller's been great for them. Not a ton of hitting. This is a team that's not really contending. But with all the controversy with them going to Sacramento next year and Vegas in the future, I see no risk in this team signing him right now. What are your thoughts on the Oakland A's, Trevor Bauer? I mean, it's, it's a possibility, you know, but I think other teams are going to start jumping on the, on the Bauer situation, you know, the bandwagon, because he's pitching great. He's, he's supposed to, he should be in the major leagues right now. I mean, he already got exonerated. So come on, give the guy a break. Let him pitch. Let him, you know, let him continue his career. Oakland, like you mentioned, you know, I thought it was going to be a really bad team this year, but I mean, they're not a bad. They're 11 and, and 17 or 11 and 15, something like that. You know, they actually start better than the than the Mets. They start better than the Marlins. Now the Mets, now they're starting there over 500, but they started really bad. So the Marlins. So, I mean, and he, he will take any team right now to, to get him a contract for the major leagues. You know, that's a possibility, but I think someone else is going to jump and get him. Well, you know, you look at the Astros and they had three starting pitchers, I believe, with a record of 0-10. All their relievers were imploding, including Josh Hader. Hader's not hitting. This has been a weird April because there's some people are doing well, mainly on the Dodgers, but there's been a lot of slow starts this year, Kareem. Besides the fact of all the injuries, there's a lot of top hitters. You're talking about Matt Olsen, you're talking about Goldschmidt. So many guys are just not going yet. And I'm not I'm not prepared to panic yet. It's April. It's a long season. I get it. As the season heats up, as the warm, as the warm weather starts, people are going to heat up. But you know what? I'm not that interested in going and being 10 games behind in the record come May, June, if I'm a team. So one good starting pitcher can make all the difference in the world. And as far as in the minor leagues, when I've been looking. I've seen that teams are calling up a lot of hitters. I don't see as many good pitchers out there. They seem to be pitching well in double A, triple A, and they come up to the major leagues. And we're going to talk about that in a future episode, but it's not so easy to find. So if you can get yourself a star pitcher, almost an ace, basically at the minimum, I think you got to do it at this point. Uh, the other point, which I found quite interesting was, um, and we mentioned it back when he, when we had the Yankee series, the exhibition between uh the Mexican, it's the, correct me in the pronunciation, the Diablos Rojos del Mexico. Perfect. You got it. See. <laughs> so they're, when they're facing the Yankees and I was watching the pregame, I see a lot of players going up to Bauer and giving him a lot of hugs and they seem to be very, very excited to see him. Robbie Cano is on the team there with him right now and Familia and from the Mets and uh, seems to be a lot of camaraderie. And I got to give Bauer a lot of credit. You know, it's funny. We're in the day and age when fans complain when somebody is not active on social media and they give very one word, two word answers. And then when you go on social media and give honest answers, they yell at you too. It seems like you can't win. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, people, you, you cannot make happy everyone. You know, you, you people is not happy all the time. They're looking always for controversial. They're always looking for something negative to, to say to you, even if you're not doing nothing wrong. But, I mean, that's how people live. That's how people act, and there's nothing we can do about it. I remember once somebody talking about the Hall of Fame in baseball and talking about Ty Cobb. The Ty Cobb in his day was not considered the nicest person on the planet. Ty Cobb, when he was sliding into a base, he would slide the spikes into your eyes if he could. And they were saying, this is not the Hall of Very Nice. This is the Hall of Fame. And, you know, we're in a day and age of baseball with political correctness. But I think at the end of the day, there's still something about being a gamer and being strong 
and passionate about your play. I remember in the opening series between the Brewers and the Mets this year, and something that I got very impressed with was Reese Hoskins. And Reese Hoskins getting into it with the Mets and the Mets kind of taunting him and him taunting them back. And there was uh, the benches got cleared. What happened the next at bat for Reese Hoskins? He hits a monster home run, gives the glare while he's going by, and he invigorated his whole team. Last time I looked, the Brewers were doing pretty well. There's something about a leader like that when they fire you up. I see Bauer going on a team with with what he's learned and where he's coming up. This could really actually invigorate a team when somebody grabs a team and gets passionate about it. Absolutely. I mean, you need some of those guys. I mean, some some teams don't like the the people who has you know the emotion and and the flair and like. Like a guy like Bertugo with the Yankees, you know, they told him to stop a little bit some of the the things that he's doing because the Yankees are very, you know, very reserved team. They don't let you do many stuff. But I mean, that's that's the type of thing that bring the chemistry on 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 the players and the team together. And you know, they're gonna fight. They're gonna fight for each other and gonna help each other. You know, and gonna get your back all the time. And uh, like I said, you know, some of the teams don't like it. You know, probably the Dodgers don't like that either. And Yankees and a few other teams, you know. Well, let's talk about Verdugo for a second because he's a guy that, you know, people whispered as far as controversy and all that. All I see are teammates that love playing with the guy. I, as I mentioned in WBC, he was one of the most popular players on the field. Everybody went around him. And... Before he went on the paternity list, so congratulations to Verdugo. He's about to have yep. a baby with his partner. Um, of course, at the time when I signed him for my fantasy baseball team, so now I miss him for three games. But I've been watching Verdugo all year. And Kareem, you know, I told you about how to succeed in fantasy baseball. You look for hitters that take more walks than strikeouts, and you look for pitchers that don't walk many guys but strike out a ton. Verdugo has walked way more than he struck out. If you look all across all the MLB teams, almost every player is a 2-to-1, 3-to-1 ratio, so they strike out more than they walk. Verdugo, I believe, was 14-15 walks, 7 strikeouts. Excellent numbers. And as he went on the paternity list, you know the Yankees, one of the hottest teams, and not the hottest teams in baseball, he became their cleanup hitter. He graduated from number 7 to number 4 on that list, Congratulations to Mr. Verdugo. What happened? Mm -hmm. They decide for one game. Let's mix it up for this game. Let's put Verdugo in the cleanup slot. Let's see what happens. What happens? They score 15 runs against the Brewers. They leave him in the cleanup spot. Another 15 runs against the Brewers. I don't think that's coincidence. No, me, me neither. Because, I mean, Aaron Judge is struggling. Even in that series, he hit a couple jacks. Uh, the same thing with the Stanton. He's been struggling. Judge is hitting one night. And Stanton is now 238 thing. Verdugo, he was hitting 190. Now he's hitting 274, 275. His average is going up. He got three knocks two days in a row. It's everything clicking at the same time. And, you know, Aaron Boone is doing a great job mixing and matching right now these guys with the uh, with the teams they're facing. With Verdugo going basically one, th one for three with a walk every single day, it's pretty freaking good, I would say. Yeah. Uh, a guy's getting on base right now almost at a 500 level in the last few games. He's been scoring runs, hit a couple of monster home runs. He has a beautiful swing. You know, he's not a he's a guy that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kareem, but when I watch Verdugo, he's more like a doubles hitter to me. That if he gets the home run, he gets the home run, but he's not looking to get a home run. He's just got that beautiful, beautiful stroke out there. Yeah, he's, he's like you mentioned, I see his uh his swing. He's patient. He goes the other way like, like he was a righty. You know, he's about the other way very well. He stays inside on the lefties, which is really difficult to do, especially on breaking pitches. He's not trying to hit a, a home run every single time. You know, the numbers, like you mentioned, you know, the walks over the strikeouts is the type of hitter like uh, Soto. Juan Soto, same thing. He has more, more walks than strikeouts too. Juan Soto is hitting over 300, 320, 330 right now. I haven't seen the last game, but I know he was hitting 321 the last time I, I checked. And I mean, but he's, he getting on base. he's getting on base almost half the time, literally. Yeah, he's 429 or 440 something on base percentage. I mean, two times 74 at bats. I mean, it's incredible. Being here in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, the one mistake I said the Jays made among many mistakes in the offseason was 
Watching the Red Sox get Tyler O'Neill, watch the Yankees get Verdugo, and I said, why can't we get these hitters? You know how good these hitters would look at the dome? And, you know, even Tyler O'Neill, he had a slight blip there. He had a freak uh, collision injury, came back, still hitting up a storm. I think he has a 1.2 OPS, eight or nine home runs. Um, the Red Sox and Yankees did their homework, and one good hitter in the middle of your lineup can change the whole complexion of the team. You're mentioning about Judge struggling. Well, Verdugo goes in the cleanup spot, and all of a sudden, Judge comes to life out of nowhere. It's great yeah. how they can mix and match those, those slots and not be afraid to do that. O'Neill went into the three and four slot. Uh, when O'Neill was going, uh, and Yoshida was going, Duran. Duran was a fun guy to watch also for the Red Sox as a leadoff hitter. Another guy that seems to be getting on base all the time. Uh, these managers are doing their homework. Yeah. Uh, they're doing a great job. And I mean, I, I, I've been watching this, this Tantum for uh, now for the next, uh, the last few years. And, you know, they put him in, in the cleanup spot and the fifth and the third, trying to move him around. His swing, the way that he swings, because he's, he's across the plate, to me, I will hit him seven or eight because they feed him only sliders middle away, and he continues to chase the same pitch over and over and strike out a lot of times. And when they make a mistake, they're trying to come up with a fastball, and he catches it. It doesn't matter if he pulls it or he hits it the other way. As long as he makes contact, he's going to hit a home run. You know, it's one of those guys, but, I mean, it's like Joey Gaggio. But, I mean, you know, it's, it's a strike out a home run. That's the way that I'm looking right now, Stanton, unfortunately. And with uh, Aaron George, he's just trying to make a uh, – adjustments because they're pitching him down in a way for the last uh, couple of weeks that I've seen it. And now he's taking the ball the other way. And it's hit, once he starts hitting the ball to the middle, the other way, he's going to be fine. Do you want me to fix for you, John Carlos Stanton? Yes. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. To me, not being a baseball player, but having watched it for my whole life, I think that is one of the ugliest stances I've ever seen. He looks lost at the plate. He doesn't know where he's starting and where he's stopping. But he reminds me of somebody very, very vaguely, the Andre Dawson swing, but an ugly no, version oh yeah. of the Dawson swing. If Andre Dawson was to spend a week with John Carlos Stanton and teach him the Andre Dawson swing, I think good things can happen there. I think that's what Stanton is trying to do, but he just, I don't know, to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, to me, he just looks really lost out there. If he doesn't get his one pitch, they know how to pitch him inside, and he's just striking out after striking out after striking out. Yes, he's chasing, you know, he, he threw a couple of uh, sliders or curlables down and away, he chases, and all of a sudden, they throw a fastball up and in, and he just see a fastball, he's, he's seen a dead red, like we say, uh, we, we chalk the hitters, you know, dead red, just looking for the fastball, but he's not going to catch up to 100 miles, you know, over your eyes, or through the chest, you know, if they throw it on the chest high. When you have, let's say, a Kyle Schwarber, I love Schwarber, don't get me wrong, and also a huge playoff performer, you can hit 198, get your 120 walks, get your 50 home runs, 40 home runs, and you have a job for life. But if you're at the point where you're hitting 220 with no walks, with 200 plus strikeouts and getting 30 home runs, in this modern day and age with the stats driven baseball the way it is in MLB, I don't know if you have a job anymore. Yes. Well, he has a job because he has a big contract. And he's coming up. Yeah. I think he has like uh, four years left. So he's still right on his contract. It's 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 a long, long, long time. Yeah. And um, this is one of those things where I always say as a GM, really good segue, by the way, of what I was about to say as we end today's episode, you were reading my mind. If I'm a GM with the owner, I am never signing anybody 30 plus to seven, 10 year contracts. Because once you hit that age of 34, 35, the odds of it turning out well are not so good. And this brings me up. We're going to look at near the end of April now, going into the beginning of May. Remember the whole Boris top four free agents with all the controversy? Yes. <laughs> so C Cody Bellinger hurt his ribs. He's out. Blake Snell hurt his groin. He's out. JD Martinez hurt his neck. Finally made it back. Not playing every day. And Matt Chapman, I just said goodbye to him on my fantasy team. I cannot take any more his 0 for 16 slumps. 
I, I'm a 220 hitter with three home runs, four home runs. I'm not interested. San Francisco, you can enjoy him. I'm done with him. Uh, I think if I'm a GM and I'm calling up Scott Boris, I'm going to say, you know what, Scotty? We weren't so dumb here. This is a reason why you didn't get big deals. And when you got Alex uh, Bregman coming up as a free agent and he's slumping bad, he's got to be sweating it a little bit. Yes. Especially in, on the year that you're going to get paid. And he's been for Houston for a long time. So that's going to be that's gonna be something like if they do with Altuve, send it to a loan contract or give him five years, enough money to make him happy. But, I mean, we'll see. Do you think that Boris has learned his lesson, that the economics have changed, people have changed? you think we're going to start seeing more extensions from his clients? Or you think that he thinks it's a one-year off and he'll keep doing what he's doing? I don't think he's going to change. I think he's going to continue to do what he's doing, trying to get those uh, big contracts, seven to ten years. Unfortunately, teams, they're not going to do it. And they're it's going to do the same thing as last year. The guys are not going to sign until the middle of uh, spring training. They're not going to be in shape. They're going to be late. I mean, you you put in a jeopardy the 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 players himself, you know. So now the players got to think: Do you really want to be with him, or you want to look for someone else that actually does the job and gives you the three, four, or five years, and that says you know continue with the career. Listen, my friend, I'm going to tell you we're going to come into this off season now. If this happens to his free agents again and they don't get their contracts, I think he's going to lose a lot of clients over the next few years. I, like I said in another episode, you could be the top agent one day, and you could be gone the next. And I don't know if it's an aberration or not, but looking at those players and what happened, I think at the end of the day, if you when you have the Juan Sotos and you have the Otanis of this world, you're going to get the money. But you can't sell me a 1998 Honda Civic and tell me it's a brand new Mercedes. And I know that's what the Scott Boris method is. And teams have this perception. If I give a pitcher $20 million a year, he's going to give me $20 million of the production. But when you have a pitcher like a Michael Lorenzen, for example, who's a 500 pitcher, a guy who you know generally is going to go 10 and 10, 11, 11, 12 and 12, steady middle of the rotation. That's what you're going to get. And that's what the Rangers got. And I think that's what they're going to see from him, which there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not $100 million. That's not $200 million anymore. I think the economics in baseball, you're either going to be a rookie, you're going to be the top, top star. It's all those guys in the middle. They're the ones who are going to get squeezed. Yes. And now you're seeing more teams signing one year, uh, uh, guys that only have one year on, on their belt in the major leagues to a long contract, which goes a lot cheaper to get them that way. You know, you get them through eight, nine years for, I don't know, a hundred million. So they're actually saving their money by doing that. They only, they give giving confidence to the young guys, but you got them locked for seven, eight years, just like what happened to Acuna. They say, oh, it's, it looks like the worst deal ever. But for Acuna in that moment, it was the greatest deal ever for him and his family. Well, you heard about Tristan Cases. He went down for the Red Sox. Mm -hmm. He was, of course, on my fantasy team and he he pulled a swing. He tore around the rib area. He's gone for two months at least. But what did the Red Sox do? They don't go, go and sign Brandon Belt, right? They go sign Cooper. And Brandon Belt, I believe 15 home runs, 75 RBIs last year. And he's still a free agent. Why? Because he still thinks he's worth X amount of dollars. And teams are saying, nope, we'll just let you sit there. So at some point as a player, when you know you have the worth, do you take the smaller contract or you say, you know what? I'm going to keep sitting out and someone will give it to me because I feel like if Belt comes back halfway through the season, he's coming on the minimum at this point. Yeah, it will. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to give him three, four million dollars just to play half of the season. So uh, if I was him, you know, I, I sign right now with a team and start getting my my uh, my swings and getting ready for, for the rest of the year. I mean, sitting at home, it doesn't help anyone. Not him, not his family, not the agent, not no one. It's only hurting his career. And and by doing that, you know, it's been a little bit selfish, I think. At 37 years old, if you or so his age, if you sit out an entire season, I think you're done at that point. I think it's next to impossible to get a contract the next year unless you miss the season because you were injured. In which case, you're coming into spring training on a minor league deal with an invite, right? Exactly. You will come with an invite. 
And maybe if you don't make the team, you not even go to the minor leagues. They're they're just let you go. Well, here in Toronto, you could see Dan Vogel back. He has a job. Joy Votto still uh, preparing up in Buffalo, but he's still doing it. Future Hall of Famer potentially. So uh, the economics are changing, and uh, teams are going to evolve, and players are going to evolve. And as we go into next week, we are going to talk about one of the most popular topics. I know ones that people are sick of talking about, but we got to cover it off because Kareem's going to tell us say, the MLB insider on this. What is going on with pitchers' elbows and lats? Stay tuned. This is the Chosen Baseball Journey.